The Colorado Cross Disability Coalition brings you How to Get the Most Out of DVR, Part 2, with Brenda Mosby. Okay, why don't we get started? So, I am so pleased um, that you joined us, and I want to um, let you know that we are building a calendar of events, virtual events, to keep people engaged during this time um, when we can only do virtual um, events um, to inform people and help them to stay calm and build power. So please check out the CCDC webpage for all of the upcoming events. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce again, Brenda Mosby. She's a um, rehab counselor, a person with a disability, and a small business owner uh, with a lot of expertise with um, using DVR to the greatest extent um, to help people with disabilities gain employment. So I'll let Brent get up here. Thank you so much for um, teaching it, Brenda. Thank you, Don. I always appreciate you. I appreciate what you have to say, and thanks for that warm um, introduction. And I'm, I'm very excited. I, I do just, I want to, probably the one parameter I want to set up is Angela. And thank you, Angela, for um, handling the um, knobs, I'll call them, for Zoom, because it's important that we interact as much as possible. So I'll be asking some questions. And I have a, um, a model that I use for myself. And that is that I'm the teacher and the student, and you are teachers and students. So I always leave myself open to learn from anyone that I'm talking to, because I know that everyone has value and something to offer. With that, let's go ahead and, and get started. I wanted to start with a short, a short, a review of our first meeting that we had. Um, as Don was saying, this is about the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. And, and these VR agencies are mandated in every state of the union, including its properties, I believe. Um, there's another word for them, but Guam, Puerto Rico, Every, um, everyone has a mandate to have a VR office. Also, as we talked about last, our last meeting, DVRs are celebrating 100 years in 2020. That I like to repeat and, and share because it's important. Things that can last that long and agencies that can have the impact that they, that they have on millions of people says a lot. It says a lot about our country, and it says a lot about the people who had this vision 100 years ago. I mean, kind of think about that. 100 years ago, there was a group of people that said, we have to do something. Our government has to do something. And the other thing we mentioned in our last one is that it was started because we had soldiers coming back from war and they came back um, and they, they had disabilities. Um, they were struggling with um, all kinds of things. And our country and the people at that time realized they needed to do something. And of course, they never thought 
it would probably be as large and gigantic as it is. And of course, as we all know, it has gone way beyond just soldiers. And it includes anyone, anyone who has been medically documented with a disability. And you'll hear that term when I'm talking about being medically um, documented with a disability, because in order to have an effective um, agency, they have to have criteria for which, what people, who are the people that can get these services. So I want to say thank you to all of us and all the taxpayers whose money goes into Social Security and the VRs. We also talked that the main mission for the VRs and vocational rehabs, they are to help individuals with disabilities to not only find employment, because one of the things I've learned is employment is not the end, it's actually the beginning. And I'll share more about that as we go along in this series and, and in the next. And they also, the VRs are set up so that people with disabilities can have a quality of life, a quality of life. I know there's some times in our society that we have been made to feel, or we've, we've put this upon ourselves that we are second-class citizens, that maybe we don't deserve, but we do. And this is a way of helping us to get back into that game of life through employment. And I think that another reason has been around for 100 years and able to do what it does, it has had only one focus, and it hasn't veered. And that's what makes the VR centers um, who they are and how we can make them effective for us. So let's go on. I'm going through my, the, another thing that we talked about and I think it's important to, to repeat that as we go through this experience, we do need support. As human beings and as our society, we don't do things alone. We interact. That is why we're doing this, because as humans, we can't go without interacting. And as you can see, we find a way. And I want to take up my hat off to Zoom and every other online um, method for connecting people because it is something that we need in our life. The experience that you will have when you go through DVR is the same thing, support. And that support will come in different avenues. I sometimes call support creating a team. And I also say it takes a village to put a person with a disability into employment. So while we're going to be going through these, these series, I would love for people to think about individuals who can support them. One of the criteria that I would suggest is find people who, when you're feeling good, they support you. When you're feeling bad, they support you. When you're dreaming and it seems like it's beyond your reach, they support you. And that is so important because many of us, as we know, some, a lot of the reason we're doing these online videos is because people feel isolated and people feel alone. Some of that is because they do live alone. 
And some of that is because they don't know how to reach out. So when you find someone, be it in your counselor. I had a few really great counselors at VR who supported me when I was going through this experience. Probably that is why I was so inspired to go into this field because I wanted to help inspire others because I know what that can do and I know how far it can take you. And during these series, I like to share parts of my story of what I've gone through and what has worked, what didn't work, how I got through it. Because another belief system for me is sometimes I don't have to go through the hard times because others have done it for me. And I just need to be able to hear them and listen and listen on how to do things differently. So creating a support group is good. Um, many of you are familiar with CCDC. They've been around, they're celebrating. I mean, I forget, Dawn, is it 50 years or 25 years? It's 30. 30 years. Okay, I was in between. So there's a, they have been um, around for over 30 years and they, are, they continue to do what they do and that's make sure that we, all of us, our community has support. So I, I wanna stress that. Um, I want to, Angela, why don't we unmute people and see if anyone has any questions before I start into this, this day. Are there any questions from anyone? I think everybody can unmute themselves. If anybody has questions, feel free to ask them now. Okay. Okay. Well, let's keep going. I've I've come up with a saying that I use for myself, and that is knowledge is power. Because the other side of that coin is what we don't know can harm us. And when I say knowledge is power, that doesn't mean that you have to go out and try to learn everything. But what it does mean is when you want to do something, when you want to get involved, it's called doing research. When you're ready to look for employment, what's one of the steps that a career counselor will tell you? Research the company. Who are they? What's their mission? You know, what do they do? Is this an agency? Is this a company that I want to be involved with? Can they help me with the mission that they say they do? This is no different than finding out about book rehabs, doing your homework. One of the things that I did when I found out a hunt there had been around for a hundred years, I went to their website. Um, I also mentioned, and I want to say this too, that the Rehabilitation Services Administration, or RSA, is in Washington, D.C. They are the federal arm of the VRs. So all of the VRs report to RSA. You might want to check out their website, see what their mission is, see what they do, because when we understand them better, we're going to have a better experience. And DVR in Colorado, just like all the rest throughout the state, they have a website. And it is just good business to go and check them out. During our presentation today, we will be going to their um, their website. It's 
one of the things that I've mentioned is that the VRs have to abide by federal regulations. And that is everyone. There are regulations that are put out. They do change. Um, but for the most part, they're pretty much the same. Each state runs the VRs. So they have their individual policies that they use to, to run the VR. And, and we're going to stick with Colorado to run the VR in Colorado. So they have their policy manual online. It, for some people, that can be a very boring read. And for others, it could be a very interesting one. But whichever one it is, if it's boring, take it in small chunks, like we're going to do today. And if it's something you're interested in, educate yourself more about the policies that the counselors and the administration have to follow in order to be to serve people with disabilities and their journey. Um, to employment. There is a policy on their website we're going to go to in a few minutes about getting started with DVR. And I sent that link to Angela and we're going to have her share that. So because, and the reason that this is important is what I have seen over the years that I've been working with VR um, as a client and as a vendor, and also sit, sitting on their console, many people don't even know that VR exists. I don't know how many times I've talked about the Division of Oak Rehab very proudly, and people go, what's that? It's almost the best kept secret in our country. There really is no advertisement for it. So what happens is when people do find out about it and then they go, well, I have a disability and, and I wanna work. So when they go there, they go there and they're like, all right, what do we do? And what I try to share with others is no one knows what's best for you and no one knows you like you do. That is why the more educated you are about VR, DVR, the better your experience is going to be when you go through, uh, when you start working with them. So we talked about the eligibility policy manual. So Angela, can you pull up their website? This should take us directly to the eligibility section. So let's start with orientation. Should I read it, Brenda? Yes, great. Okay. Sub some of our offices hold an orientation session designed to inform you about the vocational rehabilitation process. We will tell you what you can expect as well as how you can assist, how we can assist you in finding a job if you are determined eligible for services. In the session, no individual situations will be discussed. Any questions you may have about your particular situation can be discussed with your vocational rehabilitation counselor at your intake appointment. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this orientation. And I want to say that I purposely want to gather information directly from the source. This is really important when you decide to go to DVR and move forward. It's really important for any federal agency, but we're focusing on DVR. And the reason is 
it's in their policy manual. These are things that they have committed to doing and to informing you about. So if you go there and they're talking about something different, then you have a policy that says, wait a minute, you're going to tell me what you're about. Um, so this is what I mean when I say knowledge is power, because if you go there knowing what to expect from them, then you're going to be able to hear what they're saying and maybe even, you know, take better notes. As is stated, some of the offices have orientations. So it's important not to um, call and someone says, no, we just do our, we just go straight into an intake. Um, that may be their policy and that's what they do because some of the offices are very small and some of the offices are very big. Denver's office at the Metro office off of Viejo and Evans, they are larger. They're probably the largest. And they do have an orientation that individuals, if they're going to work out of that office, they have to attend. And they have a date and time, and you call that, um, you call their number, and we'll be talking about what's happening with the, the virus situation, how they're handling that now. So they do have an orientation. The exception to this is individuals who are blind. If they are blind, like I, I'm a, my disability is blindness, I am immediately assigned a counselor. So blind individuals bypass the orientation and they go straight into intake with a counselor. That is the one exception that I know about and I haven't heard of very many um, other ones. Okay, so Dawn, could you keep, go to the next? Okay, intake appointment. Your in application will usually occur at an intake appointment when you will meet with your counselor for the first time. To prepare for this meeting, please complete the personal information packet if you are able. During this appointment, you will complete an application form and indicating you are applying for services and you intend to go to work. Your counselor will ask about your medical, financial, educational, and vocational experiences as well as review your skills, abilities, and rehabilitation needs. Thank you, Don. Okay, so now you've gone through the orientation and you have decided from that information you've received that you want to pursue employment through DVR. So now an appointment is set up for you to work with a counselor. And I want to say also, when policy manuals are created, regulations are created, they are general. They're general. There is no way that they can address all of the situations of the millions of people that are coming to their offices. So I'm going to also be giving you some tips that I've learned when doing an intake because the information that Dawn is graciously reading for us is, is pretty general. You know, you go to the orientation, you listen to what they do, then you make an appointment and you go to a counselor. Let's talk a few, few minutes about having a counselor get in touch with you. There are certain things that you should expect when you meet with a counselor. And at the top of that list for me is courtesy and respect. You sh also should expect that they're knowledgeable. And all of these things 
uh, are important. Oh, a very important one also is that they meet with you and they talk with you in a timely manner. A timely manner. So in the past, when you have been assigned a counselor, you should, what you should expect is within 48 to 72 hours, you should be hearing from someone to schedule your intake. Because of the situation we're in now, I would give them a week. They are really um, just to let you know, because I talk to, I, I sit on meetings um, that involve information coming out of the federal government from RSA. And they're trying to still figure out how the what's the best way of making sure their services get to you and their services are effective. So when you make a phone call, if you decide that you want to pursue this, you will call them. And the way that they have it set up now is there's a number and Angela, if you can take this number down, 303-866-2500. That is a, that is, someone have a question? Uh, no, Don had to, to step off. It is 1030, just so you know. I'll put the phone okay. in the chat box. Okay, thank, thank you. And um, when you call that number, and I have already called it, um, I always test things out before I tell anyone else about them. I called the number, I left a message. Within 24 hours, I had a call back from someone, the receptionist. At that time, if you're interested in services, they will take your name and they will take your, and they will take your information. They will, she will then pass it along to a counselor who will then get in touch with you. That's why I'm saying I would definitely give them longer time to get back. Um, I would suggest giving them a week, giving them a week to get in touch with you. And here's a tip that um, I want to share. Once you get that information, you want to document who you talk to, you want to document what you were told. You want to document the day and the time that you called, you left that message. You then want to also document when you get that call back. The day and the time and the person you talk to, you want to make sure you're writing these things down or someone is writing them down for you. It is from that day that you want to give them that week. Now, that's not saying they won't contact you in two to three days. I'm just saying that they, if you don't hear from them within a week, then you want to call back, call that number back. You want to tell them what day, who you talked to, what the time was, that you, had, well, you were told that a counselor would be in touch with you. If for any reason it goes past that, it goes past a week, two weeks, then you want to leave a message and ask, who do I talk to because I have not had anyone contact me back. You're also welcome. My email is um, available. You're welcome to email me and I could also try to help track that down for you. Um, why don't you guys unmute and let me know if you have any questions about that. Brenda, do you want me to type your email into the chat box as well? Sure. Okay, what is it? BLM at Mosby Services, one word, dot com. Okay. Okay. BLM Mosby Services dot com. Boom. There it is. BLM at Mosby Services. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, there's no questions.
Um, so here's some other tips that I want to give you real quick. Um, before I go into my tips, I want to ask, is Bill Estrada on the line? Not yet that I see. Okay. 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 I want to, on your first meeting, when you go to the intake with your counselor, uh, remember I said that your disability has to be um, documented, medically documented. And for some, if you have current documentation, that's within a year, that's within three years, you may even be able to take five years. If you have that documentation, take it with you to the intake. They have to know that your disability is, is documented. If for some reason they say they cannot use that documentation, then at their expense, they will send you to their medical doctor for that documentation. So if there's individuals out there and you haven't been to a doctor, for a long period of time, but you know that you have a doc, uh, disability and inferred doc, um, disability or documented, if you go to the Division of Rehab, they can send you for to get that medical documentation. The thing that's good about that is that maybe documentation you can use in other areas and with other federal agencies. Now, another tip is individuals receiving SSI or SSDI or both, as some people do, they are pres presumed eligible for services at VR. They have been on these benefits from Social Security, you have to be a person with a disability in order to get those benefits, SSI, Supplemental Security Income, or SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance. If you are on those, you have a letter from Social Security that can tell you, that will state that you have been certified through Social Security with your disability. If you have that letter, Daddy. you can take it. You can take it with you. Um, you can also go online and get a copy of that letter. You can also call their 800 number and get a copy of that letter. So that when you go for your intake, you can show that you have um, certification that you are a person with a disability. If for any reason that you have that information and you take it to a counselor and the counselor says, well, I still got to send you to, to a doctor, then ask them why. Why do they not accept my, um, my certification from Social Security? And if they say, you know, they, they just have to, then another tip I have, always, you can always ask people counselors to show you in writing, to show you from the policy manual that says they have to send you to get to a doctor for documentation when you have that documentation from Social Security. Okay. Anyone have any questions? I think we're good. Okay, so the other thing that, that was stated in, in the criteria for eligibility. Now, keep in mind, I was very specific. You have to be on benefits from Social Security. If you're not on benefits and they cannot use the documentation that you have, they can send you for 
um, documentation to a doctor for their choice. They may also, there might be times when you come in, you have documentation, but they say, okay, we need to get an assessment to make sure that you're able to work. Now that assessment, if they wanna make sure that when you guys talk and you say that I want to be, oh, let's see, um, I wanna drive the bus. And they need to know if you can pick up 50 pounds or if you can pick up 20 pounds or if you have the acuity in your eyes, they can ask for those additional documentations. The biggest key here is this. This discussion should happen between you and your counselor and you should both agree that this is necessary and that you want you both want this to happen. It is important that you are involved with every step of the process that you are doing that moves you toward employment. And that, that involvement starts the day that you go and you do your intake. Brenda, we have a chat in the box. Did you find that? I'm listening. Oh. And I couldn't, she had a question at the very end. Can you see what that is? Mm -hmm. It says to clarify, will you please confirm that someone has to qualify for SSI before becoming eligible for DVR services? Yes, yes. They, to, to get into those programs, you have to apply for those services and qualify. And it can be um, a long, yes. Um, and I think that's why I stress it here is because getting that documentation from Social Security, for some people that can take a long time. And that is very strenuous. So when you go to, to, to DVR, that is what they should accept um, for, for their application that you are a person with a disability. But yes, you have to definitely go through, go through the criteria for Social Security so, in order to get this. So if I don't qualify for Social Security, then I also don't qualify for DVR? No, that is not true. Oh. No. You actually, because just because you don't qualify for Social Security, keep in mind that the criteria for Social Security is different from what the criteria to use services from DVR. That is why you, you may have had a disability all this time and chosen not to apply for Social Security benefits for whatever reason. But if you have a disability, you can apply for services at DVR. If you do, that's when I said, when you don't have the documentation, they will send you to their doctor. Okay. For that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so yes to social security is automatic. Yes to DVR. Yes. But not having social security does not automatically mean no to DVR. Right. Okay. Got it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Angela, for clarifying. It's okay. I, I get lost. <laughs> and that's why we, like I said before, teacher and student, that teaches <laughs> me to, be, to try to be clear. Yes. Now there's another tip. There is another tip that I want to share with you. And that is because you are on those either of those two programs, SSI or SSDI, you are exempt from completing a financial statement. Even if you're married, you are exempt from completing a financial statement. When you are on those two programs, they cannot, DVR cannot ask for any, any type of financial um, monies from a person who is on those. If you, you know, I'm giving these, these tips, they're going to be repeated, they're putting them out there. Um, I have researched this. If you go 
to an office and they say, no, you have to do this. Then again, ask them, please show me the regulation that says I am on SSI or I'm on SSDI and I have to complete a financial statement. The reason I do this is not because the counselors, they know and they don't, they just want, don't want to do it. Some of these counselors are new. They may have only been there for a few months or maybe even a year or two. It takes a long time for them to be up to speed with all of the regulations and policies. And I have to tell you, I don't think anybody is able to be up to speed on everything. That's why they have agencies like the Client Assistance Program, CAP, and we'll take a series to talk about that. The people in CAP, that's all they do is read those federal regulations because their job is to make sure that the VR agencies are following those regulations. But when you go for your intake and you are there to talk to the counselor, these are some tips that will help you have um, a faster, faster service. And also, it will help the counselor to know that you're a person who is informed. You're not coming in there knowing nothing. And you can, right now, you can Google, Google, I love Google. <laughs> That's one thing Google's good for, is Googling these kinds of questions and going out there. I know there are people in our community that they can read these regulations and they can understand them and they, they can explain them. I just am sharing with you those things that I have experienced. I'm not sharing anything that I'm guessing at or that I just read on. When I went to DVR, when I did my intake, they could not and they did not. The counselor I was with had been there for over 20 years. And I was not asked to complete a financial statement. And, the, and I, I give that as a tip because that can take time to do. And as I said, even if you're married and you have another income in the household, they cannot ask people who are on SSI and SSDI. And I put this out there. And if, if someone finds that this information is incorrect, I'm the type of person, let me know, tell me. But this is what I've learned over, over 20 years of working with DVR. Okay, um, why don't we unmute and let's see just if there's any questions at all. Okay, so I just gonna take this away for a minute. I noticed that we have about 10 minutes. I was just going to tell you that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And um, unfortunately, uh, Bill, I don't think he joined us today. Um, the reason I was, I was, I talk about Bill Estrada, uh, two reasons is his, his um, company, which he's the president of, Team EEI. T-E-A-M-E-E-I. And team means it takes a team to put an individual to work. And that's why he chose that. He has been a vendor for VR, DVR for over, for over 25 years now. His specialty is technology. He does assessments on computer skills. So individuals who have been out of the workplace, I mean, the um, out of the work market and not sure about their skills, those individuals who want to even improve their skills. These are things you can ask for when you become eligible. Actually, you don't even have to become eligible. Getting an assessment on your computer skills can be done before eligibility so that the counselor can make a determination about your eligibility. I'm gonna say that again. 
when a counselor is determining your eligibility, there are different methods and different things they will use to determine that. An assessment of your computer skills is one of them. And that's something they can do before you become eligible for their services because it's called a determination for services. Also, I want to encourage the individuals to seek out DVR services if you feel that you're interested in working. Also, there are thousands and thousands of jobs that are coming up that are online that you can work from home. So if you do have computer skills, if you do have a computer, now many of the businesses will test your computer to make to see how old your computer is because some computers may not be able to. But if you do have a fairly new a computer within the last two, three to five years, um, some of these jobs can be done from home. Some of these jobs can be done over the phone. I, I say this because I want to encourage people that with everything that's going on, if working is still part of what we do. So again, I would ask Angela, any questions from you? No, I was just thinking um, the, the website Bill shared the last time is Rat Race Rebellion. Yes. And I just put it up on, let me share the screen, but I just put it in the chat box, but this is what it looks like as well, just so people know it. So it's yes. uh, basically just virtual jobs, side gigs and all kinds of stuff. Yes. There is so much on and, amazing. Right, right. There's so much. You can, you can imagine Amazon and these other ones, they're just being bombarded by calls and people putting in orders and they need people to answer those calls and take those orders. And the minimum that I've seen is usually around 12 to 14 to start. And, and those can go up. And I think that it is important, even if you feel that you're not at that point where you want to do employment, that's okay. Know that that is okay. Because I was there at one time. I know when I first lost my sight, that was the last thing in the world that I thought I could do or that I wanted to do because I just didn't know. So if that's where you are, that's the place for you to be right now. For others, you can just go online, Google online jobs. I'm seeing things from healthcare, Red Cross, all these different large organizations that are still employing individuals. Um, if there are no other questions, I hope that you got information from this series and that will be beneficial, helpful. I hope that you will pass this on and I think I'll talk to Dawn and to Angela but I think um, doing another series in two weeks would help would keep this going. I so enjoy sharing my experience and my knowledge with you. And I want everyone to stay safe and have a good day. <laughs>